Johnny Wonder here with Golf WX. I am fulfilling a dream of mine for, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. I'm here with Peter Jacobson. Peter, Thanks, Johnny. it's a pleasure. Good to be with you. Uh, so much to cover. So we're going to start, we're going to go back in time a little bit. So one of my favorite movies I got of a all... lot of time behind me. Okay. <laughs> so, Dead Solid Perfect. With Randy Quaid. With Randy Quaid. Right. Let's just talk about that. That's a huge golf head movie. Your first fucking foray into, into film. Right. What was that like? Well, I got a call from Dan Jenkins, the great writer. Dan great Jenkins, Andy. the late Dan Jenkins. One of my... I, I love Dan Jenkins as a person. Great writer, great sports writer, great mind. Kind of a playful mind. And that's what Dead Soul Perfect was really was all about. Very playful, yeah. So many fun parts of the movie. But I got a call and... He said, would you play yourself at the Colonial? Because I had won the Colonial in 84. So that was part of the book, part of the movie. So we teed off, and Randy Quaid's a hell of a golfer. Of all the, I, just to interject, of all the golf movies that I've seen, he's the one that pulled it off the best. He was probably, uh, probably a, a scratch golfer playing at a five, because he was an actor, right. he didn't play much. But when we went on the range, I met Randy, we hit balls, I went, dude, you can hit this it. is authentic. You you can you can handle this. Right. So we went out, played uh, I think five or six holes, and they told us just whatever you would say to a, a guy that's kind of a nobody and you're a you're a pro. Just talk. So we did, and they used a lot of that dialogue in the movie. But I had no idea. One thing I've learned after doing that and being in Tin Cup is these movies are all shot out of sequence. Oh, yeah. So, like, this could be a part of a movie. This could be the finale. It could be, the, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this could be a part of a, of a film that, when I remember when we got all done, they said, okay, that's a wrap, cut, thanks so much. There were extras behind the ropes, people carrying signs, and it was like a real tournament, right. and we were done. And I had to wait until the movie came out to really see where it fit. And I remember he had lines. I didn't. I just had to react to his lines. And when the movie finally came out, I said, oh, I understand why he said that. Because of something that happened right. previous. That they shot six weeks earlier or six weeks or later. Or six weeks later. Right. That's exactly right. So you had one little line in there. You hit your tee ball and you said, get left ball or get right ball. You said something. I was like, you got, it. You got, it. You got a couple of lines. It was something. Yeah. It was the same in Tin <laughs> Cup when, when I was uh, cast as the winner of the U.S. Open mm -hmm. in Tin Cup. I remember Ron Shelton said the same thing. He's, oh, we had all these players. Jerry Pate, Stadler, uh, Corey Pate, Mickelson, yeah. uh, Fred Couples. And they said, just be you. Just just do what you would do playing with an upstart nobody. Forget he's Kevin Costner. He's Roy McAvoy. Right. Wearing all the, remember all the logos oh, yeah. on his shirt? Yeah. So we did, and I, I, I must tell you, Kevin Costner and Don Johnson, were so nice to us in the movie. Now, we're all golf professionals stepping into a golf movie, so I think they were interested in what we had to say and what we did. Right. So there were a lot of questions, but they were so nice, and it was fun. It's funny that you say that. You know, the, the one thing, I, and I've grown up around athletes, I told you that my godfather is a professional baseball player, and golf is the great equalizer. Like, you could be anybody. You could be, you know, Ken Griffey Jr. The moment he meets a guy that plays on tour, all bets are off. He's completely fixated on the guy that can play. Golf is weird that way. So like you're you're well traveled. You've been all over the place. What would you say, as far as golf is concerned, how impactful is it just on your life? Like how how far does it travel for you? I went to the University of Oregon and I got that. my tour card and I came out on tour and I thought I knew a lot. I thought I knew a lot about golf and I hadn't traveled much being a kid from Portland. When I got out on tour, I was like, holy cow, this is a completely different world than I thought it was, and I'm totally unprepared for this. Fortunately, I kept my card every year. I was a good enough player. It took me four years to win my first time, but kids today are so prepared to come out and win. The junior programs, the amateur programs, the college programs, they're ready to win, and we're seeing that. Matthew Wolf and Victor Hovland and... Um, uh, Colin Morikawa, yeah. they come out like that. There was no way I could do that. No way anybody in my era came out to do that, except the very special. Ben Crenshaw, Jerry Pate, Curtis Strange, man, Tiger Woods. Right. But it, take, it takes a lot of preparation to be able to win. 
It really does. I mean, and I think like I mean, going back through your career, I mean, you started off. You said it took four years to actually win, but then you kind of, you know, you were pretty consistent. I would say through the late '80s and the early '90s, and you had a really good year in '90. I think it was '95. You won a you won a Tory, and then you won a Pebble, back to back. And I remember that was sort of. I wasn't a career resurgence because you weren't playing that bad leading up, but you'd won a couple times, got on the Ryder Cup. That was kind of like your big. Your big year. Yeah, it was. I won twice in '84. I was on the Ryder Cup team in '85. But but anybody that has a long career, you're going to have the highs and the lows. Right. You just don't want the lows to go very low. You want your highs to be as high as you could possibly get. Right. So when I was on the Ryder Cup team in '85, I thought, oh, my career is going to go this way. Well, it kind of bumped along. I won in '90. But again, I was bumping along. Then in 95, I won back-to-back -back and made the Ryder Cup team. And I finally came to the realization that if you're out there a long time, you're a pretty good player. That's a success. Yeah. That's a success. In fact, the great story, Furyk, who when he won the Payne Stewart Award a couple years ago, I was at the dinner when he had his acceptance speech, and he told a story about me. He said, i got to tell you how this whole evening has come full circle. When I was a rookie on tour, I got paired a lot with Peter Jacobs, and I'm sitting right there, <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh-oh, what's he going to say? I played with Peter, he said, four or five weekends, and I finally turned to him and said, Peter, how old are you? I'm 42. How long have you been on tour? 20 years. And Jim said, I admitted, I thought, man, this guy is old. <laughs> he's 42, but if he's been on tour for 20 years, maybe he's a pretty good player. Fast forward 20, 25 years, and Jim said he's walking down the fairway with Justin Thomas. And Justin Thomas says to him, hey Jim, how old are you? And Jim said, I'm 46. How long have you been on tour? 25 years. And Justin, he said to Justin, you're thinking, man, this guy's old, but he must be pretty good to be out here. <laughs> so that's kind of a little story to tell you that if you have a long career in anything, it could be in television, it could be in sales or merchandising, you're going to have your highs, you're going to have your lows. You can't let your lows destroy you, right. and you can't let your highs uh, intoxicate you. Just keep forging ahead. What did you do well as a player? What was your What were your strengths? I think ball striking was my strength. Yeah. I was never a really good putter. My short game was never a strength. If I was good with the putter that week, I won. Right. And I had my stretches where I putted great and won tournaments back to back. But I would say, generally, my driving and my iron play was my best. It really wasn't until I became a Champions Tour player, senior player, that I started working on my short game. And now, as I sit here, a 65-year-old body <laughs> falling apart, uh, I have to really rely on my short game to carry me through. How often do you get out on the senior tour these days? Uh, last year I played a couple. This year I might play five or six. It just all depends on how I feel. I, I hate to admit it, but sometimes uh, I'll go out and I'll feel great for a week. The next week, I just I just don't feel it. Right. A lot of golf clubs around here. Golf clubs have changed quite a bit since since you got in the game. Um, golf balls changed quite a bit. So when I started tracking you, this is in 94, 95, you had a Cleveland launcher driver, Henry Griffiths irons, I want to say like a Cleveland 485 wedge, and a T.P. Mills putter, I think. Wow, yeah, that's, that's impressive. That's why I have a job, by the way. Wow, well, that, that, that that's true. Um, I had a Cleveland launcher driver remember that. that I could hit off the deck. In fact, that helped me to win at Torrey Pines because the par fives, this is back in 95. Right when you could barely reach the par fives. Now guys hit long irons to it. Sure. But I had that Cleveland launcher driver that I could get up in the air. And I played the final weekend on the South, Torrey Pine South. I think I birdied all the par fives. Wow. Because I could reach them in, I could reach it in two. Right. And I remember the Henry, the Portland, the Portland Golf Club Company, Henry Griffiths is a Northwest Company. It was a Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, well, that's right. Yeah, I played, I played their irons, uh, loved, loved their equipment. I, I saw their booth. They're still, uh, they're still going Scotty strong. Scotty McCarron played their irons for a long time. Yes, too. he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. Um, and then, you know, now equipment has obviously changed. Uh, we're at Srixon, which is a big tech company now. You know, they're kind of tech machines. So, what is your opinion? Like, do you think equipment has gone too far? Do you think it's just the right amount? Like, what do you think? Well, I don't know if equipment could go any further, okay. but instruction certainly has come a long ways. When I, when I was playing my best, I worked on tempo, timing, rhythm, and balance. Which is what you did extremely well. Which is what, it, yeah. it was all, I played a lot of practice rounds with with Hale Irwin, Payne Stewart, Jay Haas, Curtis Strange, 
we basically worked on one, two. Put the ball in the fairway. Nowadays, the same teachers that taught me rhythm and balance, they teach speed. Right. They use the speed sticks, they're talking about swinging as fast as you can, trying to get your brain to understand that you can swing faster. That's why a 280 yard driver on the tour is obsolete, can't right. win. Right. You gotta hit it 320 to 340 because you can't expect a guy who's hitting a five iron to a green to compete with somebody who's hitting wet. Right. You just can't do it. So I think technology has changed. You've got, well, first of all, the, the, adjustable, the drivers. adjustable drivers and irons nowadays. In the old days when I went down to get fit, they would make me clubs but I'd have to go home and test them and then three weeks later call and say, this works, this does it, this works. Nowadays, you can do it in an hour. Right. You can go to the range, you can test a driver, test a five iron, walk out of there with a perfect set of clubs. So it is such a such a time saver to be able to get fit properly. But do you think, because like, you know, I've talked, I've had Freddie on the podcast and a couple other guys and they used to get multiple sets. So say for example, Lynx Parallax would send him six sets and he would take the best three iron, the best four iron, the best five iron, that would be set one, set two. And kind of offline I asked him like, do you think that's a better way to go? And he's like, yeah, because I'm actually creating a relationship with my clubs. Once you get fit and they cook, the fitter cooks you into that set, it's a fit, it's in your ballpark, probably works pretty well, but you don't, there's no relationship with that club. Like you haven't, it's like an emotional connection that you build with your golf clubs where they become something, you know, a part extension of who you are. He's like, that is what is sort of missing these days. When I grew up in Portland, my dad was a really good golfer and he had a set of clubs he passed down to mm -hmm. my older brother David and I. We would split the set. I'd get the odds, he'd get the evens. Awesome. So what you did is you learned you had a special relationship with that eight iron. Right. You knew you could hit that hook bleeding runner in there, whereas the, the six iron, you could hit the high cut in. So you really learn how to hit shots. The one thing that's missing in today's golf world is shot making ability. Nice. Because all you do is you pull out the six and make a full swing. Look straight up in Eight the air. Eight iron, yeah. full swing, that's right. Yeah. The days of trying to hit a little hook shot or a, I'd call it Sam Snead, Corey Pavin, Chi Chi, mm -hmm. Seve, those days, we don't see many of those players anymore. And I'm sad for that. That's why I would love to have somebody step up and sponsor a five club tournament. You get one wood, four, four irons, right. and a putter. Or a seven That's club tournament. I had it all figured out to a seven club yeah. tournament with a dial down ball. So like, I was, I had uh, Hank Haney and Jim McLean in my podcast. Just, it's, it's the one that just came out today. And Hank said the same thing. He's like, I've taught guys to hit it in the fairway my whole life. Now I get a guy, if, if I'm you know, if I'm gonna teach somebody speed, if you can't, if you can't hit it hard, Good luck. You you're, better, you're gonna play four tournaments a year and have to win one of those four, Colonial or one yeah, of the shorter. You might as well stay amateur. Right. And he said it's changed. And I uh, kind of asked him, I'm like, look, is it the ball? In 2001 is when it shifted. He's like, yeah, basically it shifted in 2001. A lot of these kids that are coming up are used to teeing it up, hitting a driver looking straight up and not worrying about the wind all that much because the wind's not gonna do anything to the ball. Because it cuts right through it. It just goes like that. Yeah. He's like, when we were playing, and I've had conversations with guys like Dwayne Knight and guys like that. He's like, you had to learn how to understand the golf ball and what it was going to do in the wind. You're hitting off-speed shots. You're hitting little burner, you know, like you, you call it a burner, like a little low one. Or you're hitting, trying to hit it straight up in the air, getting to land soft. He's like, Go, the shot-making part of it's gone. There's a tree, hit it over it. Well, I was talking to Willie McGirt yesterday, who's yeah. another uh, Cleveland Strixon brand ambassador out at the demo day. And we were talking about that very thing. Because when I played the Colonial down in Fort Worth, mm -hmm the Greensburg Bermuda, they were firm. Right. Nowadays, they're always, they're wet and soft and in a different grass, so the golf balls come in and stop. Right. When we played there, you had to play short of the greens and run them up and hopefully have the right weight to where your ball stopped on the green. Right. So golf is different. And the other thing too, running into all the people here at the, at the merchandise show, I'm running into kids of people that I played with. Right. We were all one big, happy family in a caravan. Stadlers, Haas, Stranges, Normans, Pates. Yeah. We would all, Wybrings, uh, we would all babysit each other's kids when the other when the other parent would play. So it, now it's, it's a just, net, Now it's a net jet family. It's a net jet deal. <laughs> kids don't know anybody else on, right. except in their little space. Right. What do you, what, what's your take on, I'm gonna get into some hot topics, so you can choose to answer this if you want or not. So the Patrick Reed thing. What was your thoughts on the Patrick Reed thing? Well, 
I have two thoughts. I really like Patrick. I think he's a fun guy. I think he's an interesting guy. Yeah. But, but it's a bit of a confusing situation because you don't really know what's going to happen until you're in that situation. But I know it was a, it was a, what do they call it, a waste area or a natural area. But the ball was buried. If I were going to, if I were to be in that situation, I would know that brushing that sand back is not within the rules. I would have played it just like an explosion right. bunker shot. So, put it this way, I think we all can lose situational awareness at times. Yeah, That's what happens, you make a mistake, at the, we call it temporary insanity. So, I would reserve judgment on Patrick because I understand how that can happen. Right. I don't condone it, I didn't like what happened. I didn't really, didn't think his explanation was that great. Yeah. But I've learned one thing: when you when you break the rules and you don't know you did it, just accept your penalty, apologize, and move on. Right. That's fair enough. I mean, it, it, we're getting a lot. And the reason I bring up the question is just you know, it's it's with social media and everything. Golf, it, you know, it blew up like wildfire. Oh. That would have been when Dan, in Dan Jenkins' time, he would have wrote an article. Oh, on he would have happened. Yeah. He would have lambasted him, yeah. but it would have been. It's just weird. I'm, I'm curious to see what your opinion well, is on but, that. But then I'll throw this out at you. Dan Jenkins might say something like, Ben Hogan and Sam Snead and Byron Nelson never would have done that. Well, but Byron Nelson, Sam Snead, Ben Hogan weren't on 24-hour television. No. When you think about a shot like that, Golf Channel, CBS, NBC, Fox, any of the networks, there's, there's wall-to-wall television coverage. That's why the players today have to be ultra careful right you don't go anywhere near if you're pulling a twig away from a ball you've got to figure somebody's got a cell phone or a, or a television camera, or camera. Yeah. so for me it makes me ultra cautious you can't just be flying by the seat of your pants doing things like that because somebody's got it i have a question for you you're you're obviously you know you're on um multiple you know telecast for golf is it did you have to kind of relearn the game when you're calling golf because it's a different game. It's not where you're used to. You know the golf courses, but the players are playing the golf courses in a different way. Like if you think of Colonial, you might carve it around a tree. These right. guys are hitting it over a tree. So like you're, you're sort of learning as you go. In a, when in I started way. I started doing TV when I was 23 or 24, I got a call from uh, Don Olmeyer, okay. who did the Skins game, and he said, yeah. you want to walk in the fairway and interview these guys? I said, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing, but I've never turned down an opportunity. So I'm out there carrying a backpack interviewing Jack Arnold, Tom Watson, Gary Player, Lee Trevino when they won the skins. But doing television makes me look at golf a different way. That's what I was getting to. I, okay. And where I see it mostly is around the green. Everybody can bomb it. Right. Everybody can hit good irons. But when you start seeing guys hit it 40 feet versus 20 feet versus 10 feet, the chances of you making the putt go up significantly sure. from 10 and for 40, and the other thing I noticed was we all have a tendency when we putt to move. That's the one thing. When you watch a guy from 40 feet, the hole's over there somewhere. He can't see it in his peripheral vision. Is that the right word? Yeah, peripheral, peripheral. 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 Yeah. I kind of stumbled through that. <laughs> Sounded good. You, you, you pretty much stay in your box. I call it a phone booth. You just stay there and you make your stroke and he goes up next to the hole. But how many times do we see people from four feet yeah. They don't complete their stroke. So that helped me to be able to stay more, you know, pull the garage down, garage door down, so to speak, and putt through the little mouse trap in right, the, right. into the mouse hole in yeah. the door and not look up. So yeah, doing TV did give me a different perspective. Okay, so how how would you, so you take your game, well you take nineteen ninety five. You take nineteen ninety five Peter Jacobson and put him on the twenty twenty tour. How do you can what do you do? Oh my gosh. Play? Well, it's a totally different game. Uh -huh. It's a totally different game. I, I think from a ball striking standpoint, I think the older generation is probably equal to maybe a little bit better because okay. we would get kind of some crappy lies. Sure. We didn't have the beautifully manicured fairways players have today. Think about it. When a guy drives it into one divot it's out a big of 72 deal. holes, they're like, oh my God, yeah. they call the press conference. I remember back in the days, one of my heroes was Tom Watson. Watson would be winning the tournament and he'd hit it into a divot and he'd get that smile and he'd say, watch this. And he'd hit something up on the green, make birdie. Right. Tiger does that too. Tiger gets a bad break, he makes birdie. 
So I would say from a ball striking acceptance standpoint, the players of yesteryear 95 might have been a little bit more, a little more ability to be able to deal with the bad right. stuff, but in terms of athletics, the in terms game. of short game, in terms of just scoring, the players today are incredible. They, they would beat our generation like a drum, in my opinion. I, I mean, I think golf IQ, your generation versus today's generation, I think it was checkers when you played, and it was chess when you played, and it's checkers now. It's a little bit different. Um, but yeah, from a ball striking physical standpoint, it's a different, it's like the WWF now, and these guys are hitting forward. When I first got on tour, I became quick friends with Bruce Devlin and David Graham, okay. two great Aussies. Really Major good ball strikers too, yeah. Wonderful ball strikers. We just became friends, and David Graham grabbed my clubs one time and said, can I take a look at your irons and see how they work? So I hit some balls, he goes, come with me. We went to a garage of a buddy who had a law fly machine. They worked on my clubs for probably three or four sessions in a six month period, made my clubs better. They fit me. So that was the first fitting I ever got. Oh, okay. It was at Jacksonville and I think 81. But those those days were where players would help you. That's a good Arnold point. Palmer would help, Jack would help. Right. Bruce Devlin, uh, David Graham. I don't know if that happens today, because when you get on the range, everybody's got a posse. You got a player and a caddy and a manager and a fitness guy and a, and a, and a mental guy. A banker and a, and a manager. And a banker and a manager <laughs> and, a, and a person that's making your meals. Do you right. want chicken or fish tonight? So work in television, it's hard for me to get in to ask a question. I may want to ask a player, is that a new putter? Is that a new driver? Did you change shaft? but I can't get through the wall right. to be able to ask that question. So I, I would love to see us today strip strip apart a lot of the of that padding of the insulation the superstars sure. have to be able to get right to the issue. Okay. Last three questions. First thing, what's the what's the most memorable thing that ever happened to you on the golf course? The most memorable on, thing. On tour, something you saw or were part of that you were just like, I cannot believe I'm a part of this. Well, I'll tell you what it was, 1985. Okay. Open Championship. I'm in the final group, a final round with Tom Kite. Second to last group. Wow, okay. And we're not going to win. Sandy Lyle's going to win. We're on the 18th green, 72nd green. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the marshal strips his clothes off, runs out, and starts running around the green. And Kite and I are standing there with his caddy, Mike Carrick, yeah. and my caddy, Fluff, Mike Cowan. And we're watching this guy run around the green with the bobbies, and we're like, we got to get this guy out. Sandy's trying, he's got a two-shot lead, trying to win the Open. Right. Payne Stewart was in second, he was right behind the green. So we're all looking, going, what do we do? And I said, if this guy comes anywhere near me, I'm going to tackle him. And Kite and Fluff and Carrick said, no, you're not. He ran right by me and tackled him. Didn't you kind of lower your shoulder? You kind of, you kind of, you kind of. Well, I always say I went low, yeah. but I shut my mouth, <laughs> turned my head. I didn't want an afternoon surprise. Knocked the guy down, but Bobby's jumped on him. And to this day, what is that? That's 40 years or 30 years 30 ago. 30 years ago. 35 years ago. People still say to me, I remember when you tackled the naked streaker well, especially if at it the happens, Open. Especially if it happens at the Open, because the Open, <laughs> what happens at the Open is an international, it's oh, like it's an international, international crisis. Yeah. Well, every year, the winner of the Open gets their picture on the front page of every international Not paper. that year. <laughs> Not that year. I always apologize to Sandy. It was me with some guy's bare ass on my shoulder. Okay. Uh, God, that's a great story. Um, okay. And in broadcasting, what's the most amazing thing you've seen? The most amazing thing I've seen was when Tiger won the Tour Championship at, at East, East Lake, Lake in Atlanta. Atlanta. I was in the 16th Tower. I finished. I had to go do highlights and previews after the tournament while Johnny Miller and Dan Hicks went to the 18th Green to do the presentation. And walk, watching Tiger come down the 18th and all the crowd come in behind it, which wasn't planned. Right. And the security people are going crazy, but they were, the fan was, fans were respectful. Tiger putting out, knowing how emotional it is. I got teary eyed. I looked at Steve Sands as they're coming to us in five, four, three, two, one. Steve's a little teary eyed. And I'm glad he had to pick it up first because I was emotional. I know Tiger made a bunch of mistakes, but one of the greatest players in the history of the game, the greatest player in this era, maybe the greatest of all time, he made a lot of missteps. 
But to see him come back and win, I was extremely proud, not only for him, but proud of the game and what it can do for people. Right. It was the, I call it the biggest comeback in, in human history. <laughs> yeah. other, than, other than Spieth's reset at the Open with right. Kuchar, it's the greatest reset in golf. Um, you're the best, man. You. I love watching fun. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Peter Jacobson, Johnny Wonder, we're done.